What can I say? When it comes to food preferences, autistic people usually know what we like and don't like. And it's really hard for us to eat something that falls into the category of don't like. Having an atypical diet and different eating habits than holistics can be hard to understand, but I'm someone who is exactly like this, especially during periods of autistic burnout. I've heard it compared to gravitating towards certain comfort foods, but to a mega extreme. Atypical eating habits can include not only eating a limited diet, but it can also be connected to other common autistic traits, such as difficulty with interoception, or noticing body cues like hunger or thirst, and also routines around eating, like eating with other people. You might not even realize these are extremely hard for autistic people, especially if they have misophonia, which is extreme sensitivity to certain sounds, like chewing or slurping. Ugh. Having atypical eating habits can include a limited diet, strong preferences or aversions to certain textures or flavors, and unusual eating habits in other ways. We might eat the same food or meal for days, or weeks, or months, or even years. I made another video about when I went on a sweet and sour pork binge and ate it every day for an entire month. But the reasons for this type of eating preference is more complicated than simply liking or craving that food. It's the entire sensory experience of eating that many autistic people seem to feel strongly. It's the smell and taste, but also the texture. I like the way sweet and sour pork feels in my mouth. And sometimes the pull to have it is really, really strong. It honestly feels like I can't focus on anything else or even consider another food when that's the exact crunch with sauce and tangy taste that I'm craving at that particular time. Mm. Sometimes these eating habits are linked to feelings of safety, which is why it might be compared to eating comfort foods. But what does that mean for autism? Well, for me, I often prefer cold food or room temperature foods. And this is because of a number of physical sensations that occur when I get shocked or startled by foods that are too hot. Holy shit, that's hot! When I burn myself on a food, I immediately tense up, which makes my entire neck and head seem to pulsate. And it feels horrible. Super hot food can trigger immense fear and anger. My first instinct might be to spit the food back out, but of course, that's not very acceptable with all the rules of society. So I would prefer not to get food that's scalding hot, but it's complex. For me and many autistics, we struggle with noticing bodily sensations that tell us when we're hungry. So sometimes when the food comes out, it triggers this realization that I'm actually so hungry from not eating all day that I'm feeling a little bit dizzy. It makes me wanna dig into the food right away, even if I know it's hot. It's hard to be patient. Sometimes my brain is also thinking about so many different things all at the same time that I forget to check the temperature of the food before I take a bite. It makes it so much easier when I'm at home and I can just go and get food from the fridge or the pantry and eat it without the dangers of it being too hot. Food safety is about much more than feeling good while eating the food. And that's because of the huge role that food plays in our brain health and also our gastrointestinal systems. As someone who has had major stomach issues lasting into adulthood before I was finally diagnosed as autistic, this is crucial for not only your body's health, but mental health. Having ongoing gastric issues can cause anxiety due to being worried about not being near a bathroom 
and can lead to people like me worrying when I go out, especially if food is involved. So, according to a study done by Mays and Sigraf in 2019, over 70% of autistic children have atypical eating behaviors. This is compared to about 13% for other disorders and less than 5% for typical children. Did you hear that? 70% of autistic kids have atypical eating behaviors. That's a huge number. And this is why researchers have begun encouraging pediatricians and other professionals working with children to ask questions about eating habits and observe patterns of eating. If this is noticed early, it's something that professionals and parents can help with, which is crucial to making sure kids get proper nutrition to grow and develop. But kids and adults who have atypical eating habits aren't doing this just to be picky or difficult. It's also been shown that up to 70% of autistic individuals have GI abnormalities in childhood or adolescence, and they are six to eight times more likely to have constipation, diarrhea, and food sensitivities than children who are considered to be developmentally typical. I'll drop links to these pieces of research in the description below. All of this information on atypical eating habits is important to understand because left on their own to eat whatever they want or left untreated or ignored, kids won't get the important nutrients they need for growth and development. And even worse, they could also develop eating disorders. Now remember that not all autistics will have atypical eating habits, but having co-occurring disorders is common for autistic adults with estimates of 70% of autistic young people presenting with at least one co-occurring disorder and 41% having two or more. So having these eating habits or eating disorders that I'm about to mention does not make you autistic, but being autistic makes it more likely that you might have some of these habits and not realize that they are connected to autism. Based on research done in 2020, it's been consistently shown that 20 to 35% of women with anorexia meet criteria for autism, whereas less than 1% of the general population of women meet criteria for autism. Now, I'm no expert in anorexia, but clearly it's something important for doctors and families to know. Why? Because if it's understood better in the context of autism, the treatment can also be adjusted specifically. For instance, if the individual doesn't eat because they don't notice feelings of hunger, meaning they may struggle with interoception, it could be linked to autism rather than only anorexia. Some researchers are more recently connecting ARFID, Avoidant Restrictive Food Intake Disorder, to autistic people who avoid foods or restrict what they eat for reasons that do not focus on weight or body image. That's not to say that some autistic people don't also develop anorexia, but it's quite complicated, especially if autism is undiagnosed. Interoception is sometimes called an extra sense because it helps our bodies understand what's happening inside. But for many autistic people, including me, we struggle with interoception. So those cues that tell us, hey, you're hungry, it's time to eat, or you're thirsty, go get some water, they just don't work properly. This also can apply to feelings of being full or noticing pain. It's not only that we struggle to communicate these feelings, it's that we really don't notice them, at least not the same way that other people do. For me, I can see this very clearly when I'm focusing on something, especially a special interest. But also when I'm in burnout and all my senses seem heightened, but I also feel horrible all of the time in my body. It's all just off, so I might not remember to eat or drink until I feel dizzy. Even at the best of times, I miss meals regularly because time doesn't mean much to me and I don't notice hunger or thirst responses very well. So I try to maintain a routine to help me remember to eat from the time I get up in the morning. Then I might need reminders or alarms to remember to eat and drink. Visual cues can really help with this and other routines in general. If you wanna know more about how I use routines to help myself on a daily basis, I have another video I'll link below on that. It doesn't always work perfectly, but it has gotten much better than in the past when I would be out randomly and all of a sudden just get dizzy out of nowhere. 
that sucked. Routines for eating can also be stressful and might lead to autistic people avoiding them. When I was growing up, my family ate dinner together, but sometimes I didn't like the food, but I wasn't allowed to get up until I had enough to eat. So I learned to eat it as quickly as possible so that I could get up and leave the small talk at the table and go outside and play. But later, this caused me problems from eating too quickly, leading to gastric issues as an adult. Why are dinner routines stressful for autistics? Well, if the autistic person has sensory sensitivities, the sounds, smells, and tastes of dinner can be really bothersome. Now, I'm not advocating that you or your autistic family members or friends never eat together. Just realize that it can be challenging at times for many of us autistics. Between the social cues we are missing and the whole sensory experience that is eating a meal with other people, there's a lot going on. And that is assuming you are eating at home, in a familiar spot, with food that might even be food that you like. Put me in a restaurant or a new setting like a friend's place and there will be so much happening in my head. Honestly, I'll probably need a break afterward. Misophonia, which is a sensitivity to certain sounds like chewing or slurping, could lead to a complete meltdown because that's the only sound I hear. Then add in scraping of dishes or someone's knife scratching the plate and my whole body tenses up. On top of this, at least in my family, we were expected to carry on conversations and catch up on our day. I could do part of this, but all of the time, while also watching people's mouths full of food and then needing to listen to the conversation and respond, while also having a bunch of stuff in my mouth, which causes a little bit of sensory overload, whew, it was a lot for my brain. Now this is just my experience with atypical eating habits, but hopefully this can help you see that the autistic brain is very complex and the reasons why we do what we do are often carefully calculated for us to minimize discomfort. But we might not always be able to explain that to others. So what you might see is an odd food fixation or an atypical eating habit. But what really could be happening inside is self-preservation. The more I don't need to overthink food, the more space I have in my brain for navigating the world in other ways. This is also important to understand if you have an autistic child or one who is not diagnosed but displays extreme food behaviors. If you're autistic or suspect you might be, get to know what you like and don't like. Make sure that you are very clear when other people are involved, but also work to figure out food habits that work for you. You'll also want to make sure you're getting proper nutrients because unfortunately, chicken nuggets and juice apparently can't sustain your brain either. Us autistics are also prone to health issues. So if you have a trusted medical professional in your life, work with them to figure out what you can do to both accommodate your autistic needs while also maintaining proper health. Realize that the reason you do what you do might be because you're autistic and that's okay. Ugh, that's gross. To help with this, I'll drop a free template to help you track your food preferences to share at your next appointment, or just for your own record. It's also helpful to have on hand if you hit a stage of burnout where you need a friend or family member to help out with things, like grocery shopping, and you just don't have the energy to think of your list of safe foods. I want to eat this so bad. If you're not autistic but have a child, friend, or family member that is, be understanding and patient. What's easy for you might not be so easy for them, and they also might not want to explain it all. Or for a kid, they might not even be able to fully understand it themselves. But it's not because we are being picky or difficult. It's usually much more complicated than that. But with your support, we can trust you and also know that you're looking out for our best interest when sometimes you sneak some vegetables into our chicken nuggets. Do you or someone you know have atypical food habits? Or what is your safe food? Mine is nachos. Drop your thoughts, comments, questions, and experiences in the comments. I love reading them and I hope you find our community helpful too. Don't forget to like, share, and subscribe for more insight into autism. As always, thanks for being here. Mm. Woo!
Jamu's a little spicy. 